Hey, everybody. Welcome to Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast, brought to you by Letterman Row and Buyers Automotive. I'm Jeremy Birmingham. That's Spencer Holbrook. Uh, this is the show where we talk about a Buckeyes football recruiting stuff. And um, over the last handful of months, especially throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been slowed down a little bit as recruiting has slowed down. But Spencer and I, along with college football, are trying to uh, ramp back up, especially with you know roughly about seven weeks until signing day for the class of 2021. Um, it seems like the right time to try to get back to what we had longed to do before, which was do a, a pair of shows every week, trying to at least keep a finger on the pulse of recruiting a little bit, maybe not just with Ohio State, but around the Big Ten and around the country as well. So, um, Spencer, uh, you have um, a couple days now to digest uh, after what we talked about on the last show, Derek Davis and his decision to to end up somewhere other than Ohio State. I thought he would be out. He was. He picked uh, LSU over Penn State and Ohio State. Obviously, that's surprising to people, okay? I mean, the kid was not expected to go anywhere other than Ohio State or Penn State for the last year plus. But is not is this maybe a situation where we couldn't see the forest through the trees? Because the reality is um, this kid had three years to commit to Ohio State or Penn State and never did. So maybe we just were looking for reasons to, to think it had to be those two schools, but maybe ultimately all along, it was just not where he wanted to be. Well, I think the main point is he had three years to commit to Penn State and never did it. So for him to pick Penn State never really would have made sense because he could have been a building block for the class and helped them reel in maybe one two, maybe even three, if you're really get, wanting to get wild, of the top 10 prospects in Pennsylvania. Instead, he decided not to commit to Penn State three years ago, not two years ago, not a year ago. And two days, two days ago, he picked LSU. So I think this is more of a surprise that he didn't pick Penn State in the last three years than it is a, a conversation about not picking Ohio State or Penn State in the last three years. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I, I don't think that if he would have picked Ohio State, I don't think it would have been a huge surprise to anyone uh, because of the relationship he's had with Ohio State, with the with the way that him and Mark Pantone built their relationship over the last three years, the way that he's been recruited extremely hard by Matt Barnes, uh, Ryan Day, Kerry Combs, the entire staff. But, you know, it, it is a – it's – it's a ouch for Ohio State on the ouchy scale, like uh, that we, you know, brought up two weeks ago with Blake Miller. I, I'd put it like a one or a two, but it's not because he's not a great player. It's because Ohio State didn't have a need for Derek Davis in this class. It was, as we talked about multiple times, it would have been like, you know, the cherry on top. It would have been a luxury and not a necessity. And at Penn State, oh boy, like that's a necessity. Oh, Penn State went is zero for ten in the top 10 in the state of Pennsylvania. There are three of the top 30 players in the state of Pennsylvania committed to Penn State, three of the top 30. Now I know you don't offer them all, but yikes, for a program that's 0-3 on the season, for a program that um, has, has not proven really that it's good at developing talent to this point, you look at players like Carlton, uh, Carl, uh, Carlton Wade and people like that that are, or Lamont Wade, I'm sorry, Carlton's his father. Lamont Wade, um, you, you know, a, a guy like that who was a, almost a five-star prospect when he came into Penn State. Um, not every five-star develops, I get that, but like the the, the numbers there are not great uh, in, in the last handful of years. Sure, you have your Micah Parsons and, or, or your uh, Saquon Barkley's, but those are just different types of characters. And Saquon, obviously nobody thought he was going to be what he was when he was committed to Rutgers back uh, before he flipped to Penn State. So um there there's a problem right I mean how else is there to say it like that's a that is a serious problem for Penn State yeah they've had good classes in the last few years too this is not a, a talent issue on the field right now but but it's kind of a want issue on the field right now and I don't want to get into too much of the right now because recruiting is so much in the future but like you look at the 2021 class a lot of guys from Michigan a couple guys from the from the DMV and a couple guys from Ohio here or there I know Sean Clifford's brother is going there um, then you dive into Pennsylvania, and it is bad. You know Penn State offered Nolan Rucci. You know they had to have seen Kyle McCord. Jeremiah Trotter Jr. is going to going to Clemson. Derek Davis, obviously, LSU. Marvin Harrison, Ohio State. Like, I don't need to go through the list. And there are a couple guys that make sense where they're going. Elliot Donald is a guy who's going to Pitt. I wonder why. 
I right. Mean, it's Aaron, like, Aaron Donald's, uh, you know, nephew or cousin or something. So but then obviously there still, are family ties, but you still, yeah, have, but you're still Penn State. I mean, you're Penn State. Like that, that's not, it shouldn't be a, a given. Yeah. But Vern, there's also Texas A&M, Ole Miss. I'm scrolling through right now. Arizona State, Rutgers, like West Virginia, Yale. Like these, maybe that, maybe the kids that's going to Yale isn't, isn't uh, Penn State caliber. But the point remains like, so many other D1 programs are dipping their toes in this state. And I get Penn- Pennsylvania is a massive state that is hard to recruit. It really is. But you cannot go 0 for 10 when you, the top 10 guys are all top 250 players in the country. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Not- and, and again, three of the top 30 players in the state. And, you know, for Ohio State, I, I, po- I posed that question on social media on Saturday. What would it take? For Ohio State, and again, I, I know you're not going to offer all of them. Like you look at the state of Ohio's top ten, the Buckeyes haven't offered all of them, but Penn State is not at Ohio State's level. And I think that this is one of these things that, you know, they they've competed with the Buckeyes well on the field. They have done a nice job recruiting. James Franklin's a good recruiter, but clearly the the shine is sort of off the off right now with the Penn State program. And at zero and three, and you don't know what's coming. Uh, they they look disjointed offensively. They look uninspired defensively and um you know it brings me to a point that I, I think a lot of people ask about sometimes which is hey does losing matter to recruits and and certainly as we've talked about losing a game here a game there losing to ohio state is not going to be a, a problem on the recruiting trail for most teams because most teams lose to ohio state but when you start to lose games to maryland and to Indiana and Michigan State or, you know, and, and this is talking not just about Penn State, but Michigan as well. And then you start to hear the chirping and you start to hear it from your own fans that maybe a coaching change needs to happen or maybe the culture is bad. Um, it takes me back to uh, the recruitment of Dallas Gant, actually, when he was uh, being recruited by Ohio State and Notre Dame. And there was this idea um kind of given to Dallas by, by kids who went to Notre Dame that he should choose Ohio State. And, and it was a matter of simply feeling like the culture at, at Notre Dame wasn't going to be what he needed and what, what he wanted. And once you start hearing that from your peers, once you start hearing that from other players, it starts to become a real big problem. And clearly there's something going on inside of Pennsylvania where these kids don't believe that going to Penn State is in their best interest. And, um, it is pretty shocking to me after what Penn State has been able to do on the field in the last four or five years. I mean, they've been better than they've been the second best team in the Big Ten almost every single season. Wisconsin keeps fighting, but um, I don't know, Spencer. I, I'm I'm a little sh- shell shocked, uh, you know, not to use a Maryland Terrapins pun of what happened to Penn State this weekend, but I'm a little shell shocked. I'm in awe. I, I can't believe what we're seeing out of the state of Pennsylvania right now, and the worst the 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 worst thing maybe than not getting the top 10 guys in the state of Pennsylvania is you got memed on Twitter by somebody who wants to be your rival. Yeah. And now you, you're start you traditionally Penn state goes into the DMV and does pretty well. Well, I don't want to use the cliche of all cliches, but Mike Loxley, if he's going to do one thing, he's going to recruit the DMV. Now that he's got a win over Penn state and he already knows the DMV, this thing could go sideways for Penn State in a hurry, not just in 2021, but you talk about 2022, 2023. I mean, this you, you don't know where this is going to go, but uh, it, it certainly doesn't seem to be going well right now. Well, you, you bring up a good point because they've obviously always been traditionally successful recruiting in the D.C. area and Virginia and, and Baltimore areas. And then they were always successful recruiting in New Jersey. And now Greg Schiano is going to do everything he can do to stop that from happening. Uh, and you just you just wonder if the James Franklin window of opportunity uh, is is on the way to closing and and then what impact does that make on recruiting down the road and I think we're a few months away from seeing that question get answered in Ann Arbor because boy uh, again uh, there's there's obviously something that's not working at Michigan. Um, and maybe it's because they're evaluating talent poorly. Maybe it's because they're developing it poorly. Maybe it's because their in-game coaching is poor. I don't entirely know. I don't watch every game of theirs. Um, but you can see that recruits at this point are going, oh, boy, what is happening? And again, when the Michigan uh, 
you know, websites and the, the media who covers that program is now starting to clamor for Jim Harbaugh to move on. It, it's going to be interesting to watch in the next seven weeks how much that um, impacts the class of 2021 at Michigan if anybody defects or, or starts to take a step back. I can't imagine anything worse for them than to lose a player like J.J. McCarthy in that class. I don't. There's no rumblings of that happening or any worries about it, I don't think. But um, it, that sort of common thread being interwoven in, in hey, Harbaugh's going to leave, Harbaugh's going to leave, the staff's going to go. Then you wonder, like, what, what happens? Uh, there's only seven weeks to go. These kids can't visit anywhere else, so maybe they're a little bit more locked in than they would be otherwise. But eesh, that's right. I don't uh, know. Yeah, you look at a guy like Giovanni El Hadid, right? He's he's a really talented player. You look at a guy, you look at Donovan Edwards, who's still trying to make a decision right now. That's a trans, that's a, you know, a a transitional figure for for Michigan football. If they could land him, that could be, that would be huge for the program. He could transform the program. He's got that kind of ability, and like these guys, I I can't imagine what's going through their head. You know, Brandon Jennings, who just picked Michigan and decommitted, I think, from Florida State. That's a that's yeah. a top 100 player that can really change your defense if he if you put him in the right situation. Like these guys are trying to make the best decisions for themselves. Meanwhile, you got rumblings of a head coaching change. And I did want to want to bring up a stat that I heard and that I verified that just brings this whole thing full circle to Derek Davis. Penn State's never had a defensive back drafted in the first round ever. Yeah. LSU has. Ohio State has. Yeah, the top so, three wasn't I, working Penn State's favor. I didn't want to – sorry, I don't mean to bring it back to that, but I did want no, to sneak that in. Like, that is a recruiting tidbit more than anything, I think. But also this Michigan thing, like you said, it is – there are two programs that are going sideways right now in the Big Ten, and they're two of the Blue Bloods. And it's very, very fascinating and a little odd to see. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's obviously a talent gap between Ohio State and the rest of the Big Ten. Those two schools are the only ones that have been able to keep it relatively close – Wisconsin's having its best recruiting class uh, in internet recruiting history. So that's good. The, the program they've built is continuing to, to you know, uh, bear fruit and they're getting a lot better. Graham Mertz is going to be a star and they're starting to put some, some guys around him. They picked up a commitment from Marcus Allen, the wide receiver from uh, Clayton Northmont High School uh, that Ohio State was sort of kicking the doors, uh, kicking the tires on doors, <laughs> kicking the doors, kicking the tires on over the last couple of months. Um, he's a former Michigan commitment, the wide receiver, who I think is going to be a really good player, similar to, to Danny Davis down there uh, um, from Springfield a few years ago, who's, who's at Wisconsin. Um, I, I just think that the Big Ten is in for a, a pretty seismic shift here if this continues the way it's going at Penn State and Michigan. And to me, that's the interesting conversation of the weekend when it comes to recruiting. Now, I do want to make it a point on Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast, brought to you by Letterman Rowan Byers Automotive. To, to try to stay, like I said at the start of the show, a little more finger on the pulse of what's happening so we can get that out there. So a couple offers that went out on Sunday that I think are very important for Ohio State fans to pay attention to in the class of 2022. That is Caden Curry, the defensive lineman from Indiana, uh, was offered by Notre Dame. Finally, I don't know how it's taken them this long to offer him. He's, he's at the top, the very top of the Ohio State recruiting board, uh, maybe not just in the defensive line group, but also in the entire class of 2022. And then uh, Xavier Nwanka, Z I don't know how to pronounce Xavier's last name, and I feel bad. I actually asked him before we went on the air how to um, to get it, and he actually just responded to me on Twitter, so that's good. Uh, and it's Wampa, Wampa. It's Xavier Wampa. The, the N and the K are silent. Uh, Xavier Wampa from uh, Iowa, who's the, the second ranked safety in the country in the class of 2022, um, was offered by Clemson finally after months of being recruited by Clemson without an offer. And if you watch Clemson against Notre Dame on Saturday night, it seems pretty clear to me that they have some secondary issues as the Buckeyes do. So uh, that will make that recruitment a little bit more interesting. And um, I don't want to spend a whole bunch more time talking tonight. We're almost at 20 minutes here with uh, talking stuff because it, I guess that's how it goes when you start to talk stuff about stuff, right, Spence? Um, yeah. But the, the, the simple truth is that Ohio State's class of 2022, Xavier Wampa and Caden Curry are two of the very top targets in that class for the Buckeyes. And those are two offers that could potentially have some, uh, some impact, especially in Indiana where the Irish are continuing to 
put some momentum together. Um, they've done a nice job recruiting linemen in that state and developing offensive linemen and defensive linemen in the last few years. So keep an eye on those two. Spencer, what else you got? Anything? Uh, nothing really. I just, any, anytime Ohio State sees Clemson get involved in the recruitment, you know, you're in for a ride. And I think that's a, that's a big thing to always remember. Yeah. And I think that's, and, and uh, makes me think about the recruiting to-do list I wrote about on Friday. Um, the, the fact is I, I had landing Quinn Ewers in the month of November is the number one thing on the priority list for Ohio State this month. And the reason why I think it's so important is because you don't want to allow Clemson or someone else, Oklahoma, to, to start really building on the relationship the way that the Buckeyes have in the last few months. Once Quinn committed to Texas, everyone else pretty much backed off except for Ohio State. And the Buckeyes were able to capitalize on that. And, and it seemed to be turning that tide of the recruitment towards uh, an eventual Ohio State commitment. Um, so to capitalize on that as soon as possible, I think is extremely important for the Buckeyes because you don't want Clemson who does not have a 2022 quarterback committed, of course, and who um, seems to be going every other year with like the real big, big names. You went from um, Trevor Lawrence to DJ Ungalale, and now 2022 would be the next one where they really are looking to fill that gap. So uh, they have identified other guys early and they've got a couple offers out and one kid particularly from Texas who I think will end up committing to them, but he's not supposed to commit till the end of the season. And if that happens, then all of a sudden um, Quinn Ewers is irrelevant to them, but you just, you just really want to, to lock that up as soon as possible for Ohio State. So Yeah, exactly. Quinn, Quinn Ewers is the kind of talent that you can't – if you have him in your sights or you have him in, you know, in the crosshairs, you've got to make sure to, to land him because if, if, if you let him get away, uh, and I don't – Well, then you just, you just start all over. Kind of, and, and, and in this cycle, the class of 2022, how do you, how do you start over at quarterback? Like you, you don't get to see anybody. And you don't know when you're going to. So if you have a guy identified, it's extremely important that that guy who you've identified and who fits what you're trying to do, uh, it's pretty damned important that you lock him in because otherwise you have no idea when you're going to get a chance to see these quarterbacks in person. So um, I don't know. I, I think that's it for me, Spencer. What else is on your mind? Anything? Are we good? I think that's it. Just keep watching those situations at, at Penn State and Michigan. I don't think they'll quite have the kind of uh, recruiting impact for Ohio State that they might normally have just because Ohio State is pretty full throughout its class whereas yeah. in a normal in a normal cycle or in past cycles if this were to be happening Ohio State would be probably licking their chops ready to to, to dive into those to those kids but uh, you know, that's that's not the case here just because Ohio State's such a full class but I still think it's worth paying attention to because the pendulum may swift may shift somewhere in the Big Ten in the near future. Yeah, and, and I guess the last point I'll, I'll say on that is if you're looking for another uh, barometric measurer of, of how different Ohio State is than Penn State and Michigan right now, I just don't think there's any kids in those classes the Buckeyes would take. And that's – No, and, and that's, that's a great that's pretty point. Pretty shocking. Like that, and, and like I said, in normal years or in past years, there would be plenty of them that Ohio – you know, or at least a couple here or there in Michigan's class, sometimes in yeah. Penn State's class. There, there they, might be a lineman or two in there somewhere that the Buckeyes would like to get a part of and get in, involved with, especially on the offensive line. But ultimately, especially at the skill positions, and I mean, the Buckeyes are pretty well set. And I just, the Buckeyes are just not recruiting against Penn State and Michigan right now. They're just not. But Michigan and Penn State need to right whatever is wrong in their particular programs right now because if they ever want to recruit against Ohio state again, that, uh, that window is closing. So we are also closing. This is talking stuff. The Ohio state recruiting podcast brought to you by Leatherman Rail fires automotive. I'm Jeremy Birmingham. That's Spencer Holbrook. We'll be back in a few days to talk some more stuff with you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Please give us uh, reviews on iTunes and all those things. Great reviews, subscribe, hit that little bell. So you can get notified when we have more episodes. Um, that's it. Bye everyone.